sort of all the other uh, properties. Um, and um, now for these um, for these backbone conformations, we do another trick. We use the protein data bank to find likely conformations of the peptides. So you take your amino acid sequence and you really like one of those uh, papers here. So um, you take your amino acid sequence of your 100 amino acids and you chop it up into fragments. And the length of the fragment is really yours to choose. Rosetta, by standard, uses nine amino acid fragments for, for folding. They are overlapping. So amino acids 1 to 9, 2 to 10, and so on and so forth. And now we take the sequence and the predicted secondary structure of those fragments and search in the protein data bank for um, um, proteins of known structure that have peptides of a similar sequence. For nine amino acids, you don't find identical uh, sequences to each other. So you find similar sequences and similar predicted secondary structure. And we build a library of um, <coughs> those um, fragments. Um, they are ranked by their agreement with the sequence. The library has, I believe, up to 200 of those fragments. Uh, most of the four have this, but just with the top 20 or 25 or so. Um, so the idea of that is that we have a rapid approximation of local interactions. So these 200 or so conformations for the first peptide sample uh, the conformational space that is accessible to this particular peptide. And all the local conformations in that peptide are actually pretty good because they come from crystal structures when we put together that. These are low energy conformations. Um, Sometimes you have a very strong prediction that a certain region is helical, and then all of your fragments are going to be helical. In another region, you have a strong prediction for a better hairpin, and then all of your fragments are basically going to look like a better hairpin. Often, however, um, secondary structure prediction is inaccurate, or at least it's not 100% confident. And in that, in that case, you're going to find a mixture of different fragments of different secondary structure prediction for uh, the different secondary structure and certain regions. Um, in the absence of any experimental data that confirms the secondary structure, um, you want Rosetta to try both an alpha helix as well as a better strength in a certain region if secondary structure prediction is ambiguous. Sometimes you have experimental data, like NMR spectroscopy can tell you what secondary structure uh, 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 protein has in a certain region, and you have, if you have that data, you can input it to Rosetta, and then it will not build the wrong segment. Um, yes? Do you see the similarity in the sequences? Uh, what do you mean? Is it polar, polar? Similarity, number, number? Yes, it uses, it, I think it uses some um, uh, similarity ma matrix. I think it's a Blossom 45 also a matrix to judge similarity. So, for example, uh, isolation uh, is the isolation and such? Or yes, exactly. So, that there, are, there are these um, there are matrices that measure amino acid uh, similarity. The best they known are probably Blossom and Pan. And um, uh, these matrices are used, they give you a score for every, for, for substituting an ISO you see with a valent that gives you a certain, a certain score. Um, um, uh, um, uh, yeah, so uh, um, they have been derived from sequence alignments of, of many proteins. And how about the correlation between uh, the three residue and nine residue? Say you have one to one to three and two to four, but you have a longer one, like one to nine. Then how about those uh, one to nine residue to cut into the three residue fragments? How how the structure um, correlate to each other? Um, I, I guess think the fragments are picked independently, so it's not that the nine amino acid fragments are. Um, you need an energy function to drive your minimization. Um, Rosetta has a whole long list of energy functions, um, which also makes some of the questions difficult because uh, depending on which mode you are in, you're going to have a different energy function. Um, for the neural folding, a very simple energy function is used 
because um, of the approximation of the side chains of these super atoms. So we don't have atomic resolution in side chains. And if you don't have atomic detail in the side chains, it doesn't make sense to have like a high resolution potential for side chain hydrogen bonding, right? Um, so um, these um, these um, potentials that were said are used are almost exclusively knowledge based, so they are derived from statistics of the protein data bank. Um, but they contain most of the terms that you expect um, to see. So there is a penalty for clash um, for stereo overlap. There is a solvation potential for um, the environment of a certain residue. There are pairwise interactions. There is a term for strand pairing and uh, compactness of your fluid protein is also scored. Um, and then we seen that slide a little bit earlier. Because of the low resolution of the model and the energy function, um, the free energy minimum where the native structure usually resides and that you know, defines the native structure, it's the lowest point of energy on the energy landscape. This minimum is actually obscured. You can imagine if all of the side chain atoms are gone, you lose a lot of the resolution. So in the depth of this minimum is actually oh, sorry, that's not the depth of this minimum is actually much reduced. Um, so, and this is a this is a huge problem in the novel forming, um, which which really comes with the fact that we that we have to simplify the models and take the side chains out. However, if the energy minimum is very deep, it usually correlates also with a large width. So if you think of a funnel, right, it makes sense that if the funnel goes deeper, it's also wider at the top. This is not a law, um, but it works in the majority of cases. And there is an analysis done by Bono and Bacon um, PNAS 1998. Yeah, you go. PNAS 1998. Um, that shows this particular this particular correlation. Um, so while the depth of the minimum is obscure, the width is actually for, uh, uh, is actually pretty well conserved, and this leads to this clustering idea. If the energy minimum is a wide minimum. And I run my Monte Carlo simulation several thousand times, multiple models should fall into that minimum. So that's why we look for large clusters. This is not a law, it will not always work. We only do it in the absence of experimental data. If we have experimental data, as we will see a little bit later, we we'll always use your experimental data to find your models and try to find your simulation. But uh, for the NOVA folding, that's what is done. So this is sort of the overall process. We have this local approximation which really, which really gives us good local geometries that we don't need to optimize too much. An energy function for non-local interactions and then a clustering approach to find likely approaches. You never ever get a single answer out of this that you have 100% Sometimes you get 20 clusters and then you have low confidence. Sometimes you get two very large clusters and then you're pretty confident and one of them is correct, but um, uh, it doesn't happen that you just get a single answer. Like the backbone confirmations from the PDB, the same is done for sidechain confirmations. Only for sidechain confirmations, it's much more well known. Bottom line libraries, libraries of likely sidechain confirmations that you find in the protein data bank. Um, there are several of those libraries. Rosetta uses the libraries that are developed by Ronald um, And um, those libraries run over all aspartates in the protein data bank and do a statistical analysis which confirmations of those aspartates are for. And then in the actual search algorithm, instead of looking at all possible confirmations, we first sample the most likely confirmations of aspartate. And then in a, in a gradient based linearization, we um, go up these word of rules and samples slightly deviated confirmations. So um, <clears throat> for serine, we can actually plot that. Um, 
same just as a single chi angle that we would consider, and this chi angle has three uh, preferred um, values, 60, 180, and 300 degrees. Um, but you see that actually um, there are even differences between these three uh, values. You, this is the one that's most frequent. Um, and you see this one's maybe a little bit wider than this one, this one. So um, for lysine, this becomes a four-dimensional four dimensional plot. Um, and those conformations are uh, collected in these uh, Rodimer libraries. So here we see the three conformations for serine, how often each of them was observed. From that, we can compute the probability. Um, we also get uh, the actual chi angle, which is close to 6180 minus 60, but not precisely that value. <coughs> and we have a standard deviation, so we know how much we later want to deviate from these ideal conditions. Um, so with that Baltimore library, we ensure that we sample likely conformations, and uh, we get our search space down uh, to something that we can manage. The energy function is a completely different one from the one that we will use for folding. It has the same general terms that you would expect. But now, since we have all the atoms present, our energy function must function at a much higher resolution. So um, we have van der Waals interactions, but um, now these are really atom-atom based. They are not, no longer the residue-residue type interactions. Sorbation, hydrogen bonding, pairwise interactions and um, a probability of the Rodimer derived from, the, from those numbers here um, <coughs> is also converted into, so the logarithm of probability is also uh, used as an energy term. And um, we again run simulated annealing Monte Carlo energy minimization. Um, as long as you keep your backbone entirely fixed, even though this is a Monte Carlo simulation, you don't need to build a thousand models. As long as your backbone is fixed, you only need to build, build about ten models or so. And um, uh, often they even give you back the precisely same original information. So it's a huge difference whether you fold the protein or just repack it, as they would call it, just build side chains. <coughs> and here we see the simulation on a fixed backbone. Um, Again, this is uh, crystallographic coordinates, and now you see just in the core of the protein, so that it doesn't get too confusing, um, we do see um, how these side chain conformations are. And then it arrives at conformations that are very close to uh, the now this works great if you enter the <coughs> coordinates that are crystallographic coordinates, right? But this is not the real case scenario. In the worst case, your model comes from the normal folding, and we have seen in this movie that I folded ubiquity that the backbone coordinates were still quite far away from the coordinates that we have seen in the crystal structure. And as the backbone deviates, uh, you will obviously introduce deviations in those uh, side chain conformations that, that we find. So just taking the, the noble models and adding side chains without moving the backbone will not do the trick. We will have to add side chains and at the same time refine the backbone structure. And there are different approaches to do that in the Rosetta community. Um, um, Stephen uh, mentioned that. Um, Typically, they, they have a couple of things in common. Um, they involve a Monte Carlo move that changes the backbone conformation. That move could be just five psi angle changes or a free amino acid fragment replacement, uh, something of that sort. A minor but a very noticeable modification of the backbone conformation. A loop conformation could change. Um, then the side chains are re-optimized using this Rotomore search, and then gradient-based minimization is run to drive the uh, protein in the nearest local energy. And this cycle can be repeated. There are different flavors and deviations of that protocol, but this is sort of the, um, uh, the, the general idea. 